Welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where tour players, legends, and the top instructors in the game share their stories, insights, and playing lessons. Join Chris every Tuesday night as he talks with the greats of the game. Tonight's show is sponsored by TaylorMade Golf, the PGA Tour Superstore, Two Under, Golf Pride, Strixon Cleveland Golf. Your best performance starts with the right golf ball. Sun Mountain Golf Bags, Finn Scooters, making the game more fun. Adele Golf, hit it, flip it, dial it in. And the Mclemore Club Experience, live above the clouds. Now, here's your host, Chris Mascaro. Good evening, folks, and thank you for tuning in to our season finale of Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro. That's right. Tonight, we're wrapping up season number nine. I'm going to take a little break for a couple of weeks and then hop on over to our football show Thursday night tailgate. My co-host, Bob Lazari, and I, we're going to start season number 11 of that show on Thursday, November 3rd. I'll be back for season number 10 of this show shortly after the Super Bowl, so not all that long from now. The season finale of this show is always something that is very special to me. I put a lot of thought into whose voices do I want to leave you with over the winter. I want those voices to come from some very special people who have become very important to me and the show. And you guess what? I got four more of them joining me tonight. We'll talk about who they are in just a moment. Before we get started, I want to thank all of you one more time for your votes all season long for Next on the T in the Podcast Magazine Hot 50 list. The show is currently ranked number two, our football show Thursday Night Tailgate number four in the October edition. I am so grateful to all of you for your wonderful support and for taking a moment out of your busy schedules to vote for the shows. Our goal is obviously to get to number one, and we're so very close. Please continue to vote, and you can do so daily by going online to podcastmagazine.com forward slash hot 50. Your votes each day is what's going to get us to the top, and I can't thank you enough for continuing to do it. It means a great deal to me. All right, on to tonight's show. You know we couldn't go out without one more visit from our resident director of instruction, Tom Patry. Tom is such a huge part of the show. He personifies class and what it means to be a PGA professional. We need some pearls of wisdom from him before we sign off for this season. So we'll get a playing lesson from him for how we can keep the rust off our golf swings this coming winter. I also want to get his thoughts on Tom Kim's big win over the weekend and the conservative three-wood off the tee that came back to bite Patrick Cantlay. We'll also hear if TP thinks that Tom Kim can challenge Scotty Scheffler for world number one next year. We'll talk about live golf just a little bit and a whole lot more when Tom joins me in just a few minutes. Following him, I'll get a return visit from one of my all-time favorite guests, Matthew Lawrence. Matthew hates live golf, so you know I've got to poke the bear there. We'll hear why he does. We'll also talk about a very cool thing he did there in Lexington, Kentucky for a charity around a special showing of the movie Eddie and the Cruisers. You guys know how much I love that movie. We'll also hear about the Lexington golf scene and the Backspin Golf Junior League named in honor of Matthew's show. Looking forward to having him back. He'll join me about 25 minutes from now. Following him, I'll get a return visit from yet another one of my all-time favorites, Hal Sutton. We're going to get into the mind of golfers a bit. I'll get Hal's thoughts on why we can hit nine great shots, followed by one bad one, and we want to focus on what went wrong with the one bad one instead of focusing on the other nine that we hit really well. We'll also talk about being too focused on track man numbers instead of ball flight, and how quick some players are to fire their coach instead of taking responsibility for their own performance. Hal will join me later on in the hour. Then we're going to round out the show and the season with a return visit from the former president of HBO Sports and one of the all-time great documentary creators, executive producers, and directors, Ross Greenberg. We'll hear about the projects that Ross is currently working on. We'll look back at a few very important recent documentaries that he's done, one about 9-11 and reflecting back on it 20 years later. We'll also talk about the movie that he made with Billy Crystal, 61 and the home run record chase Roger Maris made. That chase was not well received by Yankee fans, unlike this season's chase for 62 by Aaron Judge. We'll also talk about a documentary he did for Fox called Jack Nicholas: The Making of a Champion. You guys know how much I love Jack. So looking forward to having Ross round out the season about an hour from now. 
So there you have it, folks. More great stories, tips, and information are coming your way tonight on this edition of Next on the T. And again, thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me tonight. Before we get started, I want to remind you one more time about our friends at the Macklemore. As you guys know, my buddies and I were up there again this year for our annual golf trip, and it was even better the second time around. Everything about what they have at the Macklemore is first class. The accommodations are great. The practice facility is wonderful and got even better when they opened up their Himalayas putting course earlier this year. The on-premise restaurant called The Craig has outstanding food and service. And to say the course is spectacular is an understatement. Can't say enough great things, folks. Go online to themacklemore.com to see how spectacular it is for yourself. The golf course is co-designed by our good friends Bill Bergen and Reese Jones. And our friend and PGA Tour caddy Kip Henley said, outside of Pebble Beach, it's the most beautiful 18th hole he's ever seen. Golf Digest agreed, naming it the best finishing hole in America since 2000. And Lynx Magazine doubled down on that, naming it one of the top 10 finishing holes in all of golf. See why we're all going crazy about the place by going online to themaclemore.com. I also want to remind you about our friends at TaylorMade. Golf's an interesting game because the better you hit the ball, the fewer shots you have to hit. That means the better you hit the ball, the less golf you actually have to play. That's why TaylorMade made their Stealth Irons. TaylorMade Stealth Irons feature a cat-back design and a 3D toe wrap designed to help deliver increased distance throughout the bag and more forgiveness on those occasional, or maybe not so occasional, less than perfect shots. The result? Better shots more often, so you get to have more fun more often. So if you're the kind of golfer who wants to play less golf more often, try the Stealth Irons from TaylorMade Beyond Driven. Okay, now back and next on the tee with me, just like he has been every other week this season, is our resident director of instruction, Tom Patrick. Tom will soon be back at his home in Naples, Florida, so if you want the best in the game to help you with your golf swing this winter, go see him at Crown Colony Golf and Country Club. If you can't get to Naples, download the V1 video app and send Tom videos of your golf swing through that app. Please check out his website, TomPatry.com. Give him a follow on Twitter, at TomPatry and on Instagram, at Tom Patrick Golf. Don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel, folks. Over 300 free video lessons are waiting there for you. Tom is also a member of the Titleist Leadership Advisory Board, and I get to say this one last time for season number nine. Good evening, TP. How are you, my friend? Good boy. <laughs> wow, that was underwhelming. <laughs> you all right? <laughs> You know, I'm I'm still here, man. I'm alive. I'm still kicking. I promise. What a show! I mean, first of all, Matthew Lawrence, your favorite, my favorite, one of the all-time great guys. And and I didn't know about the Junior League. Please convey to him if I can help him in any way. I'd love to do it. Hal Sutton and I played college golf at the same time, so I watched that. I watched that beatdown of my golf game on a regular basis. He's a he's a hell of a player, man. I mean, we all know about his professional career, but his his amateur career, Chris, and his his college career was one of the greatest of all time. And and uh, that 9-11 documentary, which I've seen, uh, was, was very moving. I had seven friends in those towers, so that was a that was a hell of a piece that Ross did. Yeah, looking forward to having all of them. And we're going to talk in length about that 9-11 uh, documentary that Ross did, so I'm looking forward to hearing all the ins and outs about it. You're right. It was a very yeah. important piece of film, so I'm with you. There it was. Tom, I haven't had you on the show since Hurricane Ian made landfall not all that far from your house in Naples. How is everything at your house and in the surrounding area as well? Yeah, Chris, you know, and, and golf is the last thing on our mind. Let's not be selfish. I mean, so many people lost you know, everything they had in their life, their home, their possessions, uh, you know, everything they've worked their whole life for. So first and foremost, our thoughts and prayers go out to them. Um, Patrick, Patrick residence in Naples is beyond skip. We also, as you know, Chris, have a, have a vacation home in Key West. And I, and I, when the storm first turned north towards Cuba, that was, that was like a bullseye. And, and I don't know how Key West all these hundreds of years has survived, uh, that little tiny island only 90 miles from Havana, but, uh, it, it jogged left and missed Key West and we got, we got blessed there too. So we were really, really lucky. As far as Crown Colony is concerned, they got hammered. It turned in right there. They were right, you know, we're, Crown Colony is only, uh, four miles from the Sanibel Causeway. That, 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 you know, everybody knows that Causeway's been ripped to shreds and that's at Sanibel Island and Fort Myers Beach and Fort Myers. Um, the golf course itself 
We have three pretty big bridges that uh, work over estuaries on the club. They're all gone. The pump station was ripped to shreds. Uh, the irrigation ship, uh, situation was ripped to shreds. Our cart barn was ripped to shreds. We lost the entire cart fleet. Um, massive flooding on the golf course. Paul Bacon, our superintendent, and Dave Ken, our general manager, have done miraculous jobs along with our board. So much to the extent that we think the golf course will open next week. Um, wow. Nine holes anyway. The, one of the, one of the bridges on the back nine on 14 makes it impassable to play to complete the loop on the back nine. So we're working on getting that hopefully back up and running, which will take some time in terms of materials and, and labor. Because let's, let's face it, a bridge on a golf course is not a priority right now when you have people that are homeless and, and things like that going on. So I guess in the grand scheme of things, we're pretty lucky, but, uh, so many people just got their ass handed to them and it's just terrible. Um, the, the pictures, um, uh, I've been sent besides what we've seen on the news uh, have been, uh, heart wrenching. Um, you know, I, I have people that have been impacted. My outside operations manager has a pretty massive hole in the roof of his house. And, uh, you know, the stories go on and on and on. Um, so our thoughts and prayers are certainly with him. It was, it was, uh, it was devastating. Yeah, a hundred percent. We certainly are. Continuing to pray for the people who live along the path that Ian took across the state of Florida. Folks, you can help by going online and do donating at redcross.org. Tom, when it comes to the impact that the storm is having, like I say, on golf and the local economy and PGA professionals like yourself, talk about the damage that salt water and flooding are going to have on the local golf courses down there, plus the seasonal residents who may or may not have a house to come down to this winter and the trickle down effect that that's going to have on you, your peers and the winter season down in Southwest Florida. Yeah, because I mean, I don't know if people outside of Florida really understand the word past column. The past column is a, a salt tolerant hybrid grass that was created a few years back that, um, if your golf course is past column, which Crown Colony happens to be, it's extremely salt water tolerant and, and, and can, can sustain that kind of impact of salt water once it once it dissipates. Bermuda grass is a different story. Uh so for the clubs that haven't regressed in past column and were underwater for any length of time and had Bermuda grass, they will probably lose their entire golf course. Uh which means they'll have to go through a regress and this winter for all intents and purposes will likely be dead. Um so they'll be severely impacted. Um their memberships will be impacted and obviously their golf operation will be impacted uh in a very critical way. Um, the big, you know, for me personally and people who do what I do for a living in terms of teaching, the big question mark right now is, and I, we don't know the answer yet, how many of my students who normally come to Florida as winter birds, um, homes are impacted or don't have a home to come to or is partially damaged and don't want to come down until it's repaired, um, and then probably be almost impossible for them to find a rental for the winter because everybody's in the same boat scrambling for a rental if they do want to come down. How many people will just say, I'm not going down this winter period? So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to my winter. I, I, I could, I could be fine. I could be a little bit below average or I could be, you know, severely impacted by a lack of business because we don't have the numbers in Florida that we normally have during the winter. So these are all question marks that we don't have the answers to right now. Um, and obviously myself and people who do what I do for a living across that that region or have their fingers crossed, uh, we have no way of really knowing the answer to those questions yet. Well, we're all going to continue to pray for everybody down there who has been impacted in any way. And folks, you can go online to donate at redcross.org. I highly recommend and, and, and plead with you. Please help our friends out in South Florida. Let's get them all back in their houses and on their feet as soon as possible. Tom, let's switch gears. And the last time we talked on the show, we talked a little bit about Tom Kim, a guy who could be the next big thing in the game of golf, played really well at the President's Cup. Then he goes out and wins this past weekend at the Shriners Children's Open. And not only did he win, he played all four rounds without making a single bogey. Shot 65, 67, 62, 66. Wins the golf tournament by three. We'll talk more about the finish of that golf tournament in a moment. But I want to get your thoughts on what we're really now starting to see from Tom Kim. Listen, Tom Kim, obviously, 
obviously is undeniably an incredible talent, a young talent, 20 years old, has played uh, an incredible stretch of golf. I mean, incredible. Um, but just like I always caution people when these these flashes come along, are they a flash? Are they sustainable? Uh, we're always, it seems like we're so anxious right now. We're so over anxious to anoint a new king since Tiger is not quite Tiger anymore. We, we, we want that next Tiger Woods. And, and listen, Tom Kinn may, may turn out to be a, an incredibly good world class superstar, but we have a long way to go to see somebody do what Tiger did and what Jack did before him. Um, and listen, I, I think the, the kid, if you saw his, his talk after he came off 18 green on Sunday, he's very well spoken. He's very classy. He's very, very grateful. Uh, he said all the right things. I thought he was extremely sincere, but we're always over anxious to anoint the next superstar. And it's, it's a little bit too early yet as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. No, a hundred percent with you. But when is it appropriate? Right. I mean, I think we got to think about it. You're right. We all want to jump on. Oh, he, you know, if he wins another time, oh, it's the next Tiger. I mean, he's won two times yeah. in his last four outings. Right. He's won twice on the PGA Tour, younger than anybody else has ever done it. Beat Tiger by six months, getting his second PGA Tour win. So, yeah, everybody is already on the starting line. We want to say he's the next. Right. But when is that, do you think, appropriate? If he wins a third time, well, if he we- wins a major or, or do we really need to say, you know, hey, Come to because we've seen Dustin Johnson win twenty times and all that sort of stuff. Come talk to me when he gets to twenty five and ten, or, you know, with respect to majors. When do you think it's right? Well, Chris, I mean, the first witness test is going to be in April, right? We're all going to be putting a lot of heat on him and, and a lot of eyeballs on him in a at Augusta, right? So that'll be the first witness test, and then obviously the, the three majors that follow that this year, uh, World Golf Championships. You know, key, key events that are a little bit larger and grander than the next in the tournament players championship, things like that. And, and, you know, think about how much pressure he has as you get closer to April, you know, because everybody's now eyeballs on him, full hands on, all hands on deck. So there'll be some stopping points where we'll take a little, you know, a little accounting of how he's played and how he's responded to the pressures of that spotlight. Um, but listen, he, he has all the equipment. He, he swings the club beautifully. He drives it beautifully. He, uh, he, he rolls the ball in the greens beautifully. He seems very calm in his demeanor. He's having a great time. He plays pretty loose. You know, he's got all the tools. So it just, it just, what does he do with them now? And, and, and uh, what are the stops along the way? How does he perform at certain key stops? You talk about his swing. And that's another thing that I wanted to get your thoughts on because he looks so smooth out there. It reminds me of Freddie or, Ernie Els, there doesn't appear to be a lot of stress on any part of his body. He doesn't seem to be, he's not a, a Justin Thomas out there swinging out of his shoes. Everything just seems to be nice and fluid and the ball still goes a long way. What are your thoughts about his swing? Yeah, I, I break down, I break down golf swings very, very rudimentarily, Chris, on tour to, uh, into two categories, swingers and hitters. You know, Arnold was a hitter. Um, Jack to some degree was a hitter. Um, Tiger was kind of a combo. Uh, Freddie's definitely a swinger. VJ was a swinger. I think Tom Kim is a swinger. I think one of the great things about swingers is they tend to last longer because like you just said, Chris, it's a great point you made. They put less stress on the body and we know how much golf these guys play now, how long the season is and how many, how many events they play. Um, and how that lower back and shoulders and, and, and elbows and, and, and wrists hold up under pressure with, you know, over time and the wear and tear the body takes. So swingers tend to last a lot longer and I think that was stress. Um, so I think in that, in that department, certainly he's got, he's got thumbs up right there. Tom, when you, when you look at his three stroke margin of victory, and for those who didn't watch the tournament, you just saw what the final leaderboard looks like. What do you think? Well, he must have just cruised on home, but he and Patrick Cantley are tied on the 72nd tee. And Cantley elects to try to play it safe with the three wood off the tee and ended up unfortunately pull hooking it into the waste area. What'd you make of his decision to pull three wood and then having it backfire on him? Well, I, you know, I, I, I was a little confused, Chris, frankly, by it. He, if you watch the back nine in the last round, which I did, Cantley swung the driver beautifully all day long. I mean, just piped it all day long. And then he gets up 18, and, and Tom Kim, if you looked over in that film, already has driver out in his hand, and Patrick pulls three wood. And, you know, sometimes, and I, I don't, listen, I, I wasn't there, and I'm not in his head, so I don't know what he's thinking, but 
sometimes you get a little too conservative coming down the stretch and the juices are flowing and you make that kind of guidey type of swing, things don't work out very well. And it looked to me like a very guidey type of swing, like he was trying to protect and, and not really swing at it. And he swung at it beautifully and aggressively with the driver, the whole back nine. So I think he kind of might have overthought the situation and backed himself into a little corner and, and, and just made the wrong swing at the wrong time. I, I didn't expect it. I don't think anybody else, and I'm sure he didn't expect it, but he, but he did it and, and then just compounded it by, you know, making a complete mess of the golf hole. Um, and, it, and let's not forget, he made seven to tie for second, but he made a 30 footer or a 25 footer to make seven to tie for second. Um, right. So, uh, it, it was, it was, it was not, it was not pretty, but it was hard to watch. That leads to my next question, Tom, about how fragile a golf tournament is. One bad decision, one bad swing, like we saw from Cantlay, can cost you the tournament, which is the same thing we saw earlier this year with Mito Pereira when he was trying to win the PGA Championship. Talk about the fragile line between winning and coming in second. And what about Danny Willett, right, just a couple of weeks ago, right? I mean, right. It's, it, it, people don't realize that when you win a golf tournament at that level, a lot of things, a lot of things go your way. You know, let's talk about Freddie at the Masters on the bank on number 12, right? We can go, we can go to so many different situations. Um, you know, Ricky Fowler hitting it to the right of the pin on 17 of the tournament players championship coming down the stretch when he won there. I mean, so many things go right when you win. You make a bad swing, but it turns out okay. It gets safe for some reason. And then somebody chasing you makes one bad swing at the wrong time. I can't really did, and, and it, you know, it implodes. The, 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 there's such a fine line out there between between winning and losing on that tour when you have 144 players gathered at the same site on a Thursday. So many things have to go right for you to win a golf tournament. Um, so many. Uh, and I, I don't think the public really realizes over the course of four days, because they don't see every shot a guy hits over four days, how many things might have gone his way, a good line, a bunker, a ball maybe rolling through a divot and into a good lie, uh, you know, a putt that was hit too hard, catching this dead center of the hole and popping up and going in. You know, we've seen all kinds of different crazy things happen. And conversely, we've seen some awful breaks off of not very bad shots sometimes, you know, turn out to be a disaster. So it's such a fine line, Chris. It really is. Let's take that a step further, Tom. You, you mentioned Ricky Fowler. And we've seen some young players go from being dominant or at least at the top of leaderboards on a regular basis. We saw Jordan Spieth go through a slump, but he came out on the other side. Unfortunately, Ricky Fowler has not. As an instructor, how do you help a player like Ricky, who has been very close? We know he's finished second in, in several majors. Now he's struggling to make cuts on any regular basis. How can you help a guy like Ricky find his way back? Well, I think one of the things Ricky did recently, and I think it's going to pay dividends for him, is he he went back to Butch. Um, I think that's going to be, a, a, you know, it's going to turn out to be a good and a productive move. I, I I'm a big Ricky fan. Uh, I don't know Ricky at all, uh, but I, I I enjoy watching him play, and I I enjoy the personality and interaction and what he gives back to the game on a regular basis. Um, so I'm I'm praying that you know Butch turns him around. But boy, when you get going the wrong way in this game, sometimes Chris and 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 thing the, the momentum goes the wrong way we saw with ian baker finch in his career that you know he went he, he was playing on his way to maybe being the best player in the world and got derailed a little bit trying to make a swing change and never found his way back same thing with Len, wayne levy going way back in, in time um so it, it's very fragile man it's so fragile this game and and the psyche of the player is so fragile uh, as a coach you have to you really it's a skill it's a real skill set the coaching part, not the teaching part of saying the right thing at the right time, you know, and not being overzealous about what you say, but just, you know, pushing the right buttons. It's, you can go the wrong way as a coach and, and make a real mistake with these guys by opening your mouth too much sometimes. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts out there and, and, it, and it's, it's really fragile. Tom, just a couple more before I let you go. And, by the time we get back together on this show, we'll be looking forward to the Masters. Do you think when invitations go out for the 2023 Masters, does one <laughs> arrive at the house of Phil Mickelson, Dustin Johnson, Sergio, Cam Smith? Do they get to go out to the mailbox and, and see an invitation in there? 
you know, it's been, it's been awful quiet, hasn't it, from Augusta? With all this, with all this live stuff that's gone on and all these things we've read and, and all the comments that have been made on both sides and, and tempers have certainly flared and it's been very emotional. Very quiet in Augusta, Georgia, isn't it, Chris? I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I know what I'd like to see happen, but I don't think it's going to. I don't and think what's that? Will pull the, well, I don't, I, I think I, I'd like to see him, uh, ask to stay at home. You know, I'd like to see him take a pass on him myself. Um, but I don't think the Masters will do that. I don't think Fred Ridley will do that. Uh, I don't think it's their style to do that. They, they kind of be, I think they're going to be unemotional and neutral spectator to this whole debacle. Um, but I, I'm certainly with, with our next guest, Mr. Matthew Lawrence. Uh, and I, and I, I hate the word hate. I really don't like the word. I don't, I try not to use the word. But I have a hard time not using it when it comes to my feelings about Liv Golf and Greg Norman and what's going on there. Tom, we can't let you go without getting a playing lesson from you. As we were talking earlier on, we don't know what the winner is going to to bring. We don't know how many people that I know you like to say, get on JetBlue and come see me down in Fort Myers. We can't do that. <laughs> what it, What are some indoor drills that we can do so that we don't get to spring and have, you know, now all of a sudden our swings are really rusty. We haven't picked one up in a while. What can we do indoors to keep the rust off of it? Well, Chris, I, I don't think that there's any secret. We've talked so much about this, and so many instructors do, but they're north and contingent. But, you know, you, you've got to have a place uh, in your garage, uh, in a room with a high ceiling, on your back of an eye, somewhere where you can swing a golf club. Uh, I love the Orange Whip as a product that people know what that is. They can look it up online. I love them swinging that all winter long. And I, and I don't mean, and here's the thing. I don't mean swinging it once a week. I mean swinging it 15, 20 minutes a day, every day. Don't let your body get what I call golf stagnant. Uh, you always have to be making motions with some kind of toy like an orange whip. Just keep your body and your golf muscles alive. Don't let them get stagnant for too long. And then certainly, as you know, my favorite mantra is short game, short game, short game. And everybody should have Everybody should have a putting mat in their house somewhere where they can roll the ball and, and keep their feel and touch alive. Uh, and then, and then the third thing I always suggest, Chris, is, you know, you gotta, you gotta get off the couch and do some stretching. You know, you gotta, you gotta be stretching your body every day. I, I do it twice a day and then PM. Now, even though I'm an old, old fat guy, I, I, I stretch those muscles every day. Um, AM and PM, you gotta do some kind of stretching to keep your body golf centric. So if you do those three things, the orange with a putting mat and you do some stretching, you know, you, you can stay in the ball game. And then you get that, you get that Indian summer day, you get that warm day and the local driving range open, you know, go down there and, and get some live action in. Definitely hit some shots. Tom, before I let you go, remind our listeners now, how can they stay up to date with all the great things you're doing? Find you on your website, find you on social media, and then if possible, come see you at Crown Colony. Chris, more importantly, how about the ranking on, on, on the podcast rankings of Chris Mascaro, Next on the Tee, and the football show? Let's talk about that. And let's talk about the viewers, making sure they get those votes in for you each and every day and certainly each and every week and the great job you do. And then bringing guests on like my man Matthew Lawrence coming up, Hal Sutton, you know, and so many great people and instructors. That's what's more important to talk about. And then my final comment will be before I let you go, is please say some prayers to those people down in Fort Myers. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Again, redcross.org, folks, go out there and donate so we can get these folks back up and on their feet and it's safe again. My goodness, nothing is more important than our friends down in Florida and getting them back in their home soon. Tom, I can't thank you enough for this season. You're fantastic, my friend. I love you. Wouldn't want to do this show without you. you. Thanks, buddy. Have a great time. We'll, we'll, we'll talk certainly off the, off the air, you know, almost every week. And uh, I love what you do, pal. You're the best. I appreciate you, TP. Take care. Stay safe, my friend. We'll catch up soon. Bye, pal. Okay, buddy. See you, Tom. Again, that's the great Tom Patry. At Tom Patry on Twitter, at Tom Patry Golf on Instagram, TomPatry.com is the website and his uh, his YouTube page, folks. Like we say every every other week when he comes on. 300 free playing lessons for you. And as Tom said, and I'm a huge proponent of the Orange Whip as well, get out there and get swinging. Whether Wherever you can get 
inside, in your garage, like I say, in a sunroom or someplace that's got high ceilings. That's a great piece of advice to keep those golf muscles in shape over the wintertime. Tom is just a fantastic instructor, folks. If you have an opportunity to go down to Fort Myers, you should do it. And if you don't, then you should send him videos of your swing through the V1 video app. And uh, he'll get you he'll get you up to date and ready to go. By the time the, the spring thaw comes, you're going to be beating your buddies and getting in their pockets. So be sure to do that. Tom is fantastic. I love him. We'll catch up with him soon. Before I get to my next guest, Matthew Lawrence, I want to remind you about a couple more of our friends, starting with the folks over at Two Under. Two Under Men's Performance Briefs have just released their new Spring and Summer 22 collections with fun, new, and exciting prints like the Freedom 2 and 3, Santa Fe, Tigers, Zebras, and Duckies, and their new exclusive Folds of Honor collection where they donate 20% of all Folds of Honor sales proceeds to that cause. The patented Joey Pouch technology delivers maximum comfort, fit, and performance while preventing any unwanted skin-on-skin contact or chafing. Good for anything from the golf course, to the boardroom, to the bedroom. You can find these two underperformance briefs in over 4,000 golf pro shops nationwide, all Shields sports stores, all PGA Tour superstores, Golf Galaxy, Dillard's, and other fine retailers near you. You can also order them online at twounder.com. That's the number two, U-N-D-R dot com. Two under, performance in your pants. Use code NEXT20, that's N X T. T-E-E-20 for a 20% discount on the Two Under website. I also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Golf Pride. We deal with a lot on the golf course, whether you're teeing off in front of a crowd, hitting a four iron after a rain delay, trying to figure out wind direction, or second guessing club selection. It's easy for your mind to race. That's exactly what drove Golf Pride to create the all new CPX. It's made with a unique EXO diamond quilted pattern. Reducing vibration in your hands on every shot. The EX Diamond Quilted Pattern really helps your hands sink into the club on every shot, giving you maximum comfort because when your hands are comfortable, you're comfortable. CPX is available now on GolfPride.com or at your local retailer. Okay, now back and next on the tee with me is one of my all-time favorite actors, radio hosts, and people on the planet for that matter, and that's Matthew Lawrence. You guys hear me talking about Matthew's show, Backspin Golf, all the time here on this show and over on Twitter on Sunday mornings because it's fantastic and it's the best way to start your Sunday mornings. The show is now on hiatus, but check out podcast versions of it, which you can find on WLXG.com. He also has a daily show that you can tune into during your lunch break, appropriately called The Matthew Lawrence Show. Back in 2020, Matthew was recognized by the Kentucky section of the PGA of America as their media representative of the year for his great contributions to the game. Among Matthew's other work on the big screen is his stellar performance as Sal Amato, the bass player on Eddie and the Cruisers, which you guys know is one of my all-time favorite movies. You've probably also seen Matthew on Saturday Night Live, Beverly Hills 90210, One Tree Hill or 30-something. He's also been a sideline reporter and a pre- and post-game host for Duke Basketball, now doing it for Kentucky Basketball, And as I said last night on Twitter, as stars go, they don't come bigger or better than Matthew Lawrence. And who can forget this magical message I got from Matthew when I was reaching out to him to talk to him one Sunday morning about his show, Backspin Golf. All right, it's 8.03. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going back to bed. Warms my heart every time I hear it. Good evening, Matthew. How are you, my friend? Was that really my voice? Saying yeah, hundred percent. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. And why would I? I mean, uh, anyway. Hi, Chris. It's great to talk to you again. <laughs> all right. So before we get into all the golf stuff, we we gotta we gotta get an update on your health. How you just had a hip replacement? How you feeling? Uh. I'm actually feeling pretty good. Uh, tomorrow it'll be a week since I had my hip replaced. And, you know, it, it was inevitable, Chris, because I don't know if this has been talked about enough, but ever since I started playing golf, which I wasn't, I was 31 when I took the game up, which is some 70 years ago now, uh, I have been 
everybody talks about that guy Bryceps and Dustin Johnson with their hips going through. And I know the great Tom Patry talks about it, but I really was the first one, you know, used my hips. The rotation was just has been for decades, you know, uh, it's no, let, oh, let me just put it this way. It's not a shock that I needed a hip replacement because, you know, how else do you hit the ball 215 off the tee if you're not using <laughs> your hips? Um, so, uh, uh, it wasn't a shock to me. Um, I, uh, it, this is actually pretty funny. When I went, my hip had been bothering me for a couple of months and I thought I had pulled a, a muscle either in my upper quad or my groin. And I finally went to my friend who's a big orthopedic surgeon here in town. And he said, well, let's take an x-ray and let's see what's going on. And he brought me over and he showed me where I had a big bone spur in my hip. And he said, you are, you have severe osteoarthritis in your hip. And he said, uh, we're going to, you're going to have to have it replaced. You know, we'll see how soon we can do it. And then he said, here's the good news. Uh, if you're getting this done now, you know, by the spring, when you go back to when you can get out and play again, you're going to be able to rotate your hips like you haven't felt in a long time. And I said to him, let me tell you something about my golf game. I used to be a five handicap years ago. Even then, I never used my hips in my golf swing ever. I don't know how I play. But I don't do what all those videos show you to do. I said, so I'm glad I won't be hurting, but it's not going to have an effect on my golf game. He, he started laughing. He thought it was pretty funny. I don't know. I, I you know, yeah. I expect to hear 235, 240 come springtime. Come on. You can rotate. Yeah, well, I do. I, I've seen you on Dancing I, with the I, Stars. I, oh, my Lord. Oh, yeah. You, you've seen me on a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dancing with the stars and I'll just bring it up. Circus of the stars with that ridiculous <laughs> picture you put on Twitter of me today. Yeah. Anyway, any, I found that any show that contains the word of the stars or something, I'll do it. I'll be honest. I have no pride. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> Speaking of anyway, uh, my, uh, my hip, just to wrap this up, I'm doing well. I had physical therapy for the second time today. And so I'm, I'm sore right now because we did a lot, but she told me that, um, she, uh, uh there are very few people that she works with that are as far along after six days as I am. So I'm very wow. grateful to the surgeon and I think I'm doing really well. I'm having a lot of trouble sleeping. Uh, which, you know, I think mentally I'm anxious about turning the wrong way or whatever. But the good news is when you have, uh, a smart TV with Netflix and all the other things available to you, you don't mind being up at three in the morning because, you know, <laughs> there's always something to watch. <laughs> always. <laughs> uh, that's great. Oh boy. Matthew, you recently did something very cool there in Lexington with a special screening of Eddie and the Cruisers at a local historic theater. Talk about that event. You know, um, I've said this before, and I've said it to you because, you know, you're such a big fan of that movie. It's one of the first things we talked about, I think, maybe the first time we ever did a show together, whether it was yours or mine. And... um it always has amazed me that that movie was done. This is hard to believe. Next year, it'll be 40 years since that movie was wow. released. And, you know, when, when the movie came out, it was gone in, I don't even think it lasted two weeks in the theater. And to think that 40 years later, I could do something like I just did. Um, because so many people love that movie, uh, is staggering to me. Um, you know, I think we've talked about that. It, it showed it was the advent. It's how long ago it was of HBO. And when HBO came on and the movie went on HBO, 
I don't know, six or eight months after it was in the theater. The album went triple platinum within a month, I think. It just showed the power of cable TV. And ever since then, I am always amazed at people's reactions to the movie. And about a year ago, I I had a thought to me, you know, I wish they would release it again in the theaters because there are so many people that would love to see it. And I tried to get something going back then, and it kind of fell apart. And, you know, uh, I think it was kind of right towards the, the end of the pandemic. And and then when the flooding in eastern Kentucky happened, as we all know about recently, uh, I was just sitting around at, at home one night, and I thought, I wish there was something I could do to help. Um, and I had the idea that maybe if I could get uh, the Kentucky Theater, which is an iconic theater here in Lexington, it's been there for decades, um, maybe we could do a showing and we could, you know, raise some money uh, for a night. And I went over and spoke to Hayward Wilkerson, who is who uh, runs the theater, a wonderful, wonderful man. And I told him my idea. And within 10 seconds, he said, oh, absolutely, we're doing this. And so along with my friend Dennis Dillon, who is uh, a great DJ on our classic rock station here in Lexington and a friend of mine, uh, we put together a proposal to do a special one-time only showing of the movie. Uh, we did it about three weeks ago, maybe, or two weeks ago on a Saturday night. Uh, we publicized it for a couple of weeks on social media and on the radio and um, had online donations. And it was, Chris, one of the great nights of my life. Um, because, and I, I said my original thought was, I don't care how much money we raise. If 10 people show up and we raise $200, that's more than they have. And we'll get a chance to see the movie and it'll be great. I was, I did a question and answer after the showing of the movie. And what happened was, uh, we got a ton of online donations. We're still, uh, they're still tabulating how much we're going to send to our friends at the ARH Foundation in Eastern Kentucky, but um, we got a ton of online donations, and there were about, I want to say, 70 or 80 people showed up, which was really good because, like an idiot, I completely forgot that there was a University of Kentucky football game at home that night at the same time, uh, and I heard from so many people that they wished they could have come. But the amazing part of this was before the movie for about a half hour, I was there early and all these people started coming in, most of whom I didn't, I had never met and didn't know. And they would come up to me and take, want a picture with me and then worry about why the movie was so important to me, to them. And here I go again. Uh, here, you know me, Mr. Sapp getting choked up over everything. Um, uh, I have a friend and I never knew this about her, but these are the kind of stories I heard all night, really. She said that the movie, her father uh, passed away when he was 41 from a brain tumor. And she said, as he was deteriorating, uh, his favorite movie in the world was Eddie and the Cruisers. He had watched it over and over and over and over again. And she had a red convertible, she said, and as his, his health was deteriorating, what we would do is if he felt well enough, we would get in my, oh boy, we would get in my red convertible. Dad and I would drive around for as long as we could listening to the soundtrack of the movie over and over and over again. She said, and it was the only time that he was happy that I was with him towards the end. She said, that movie will always, you know, mean so much to me. And I heard stories like that over and over and over again. It was just an incredible night, Chris. It was, uh, and of course, you know, when you 
as we all get older, you, somebody will send you or you'll see a memory on Facebook of you from 20 years ago. And you look at it and you go, boy, look how young I was. Isn't that something? Well, how do you think it feels to sit in a theater and see yourself 30 feet high from 40 years ago? How do you think that feels? <laughs> well, that was a good looking guy 40 years ago. Yeah, that's exactly the point. And then you go, what the hell happened? What? Wait a minute. That was me. But it's not just a picture. It's 40 feet high in front of you. Um, but the whole night was just, it was magical. It really was. And uh, as I said, we raised a good deal of money for the, for the great people in Eastern Kentucky. And what, you know, we talk about Fort Myers and by the way, is, you know, one of both of our favorite people on the face of the earth, Tom Patry, uh, and those people down there, um, are just amazing. And it was great to be able to do something, uh, for them. And, you know, the people that did it are the people that donated online and that came. Uh, to the movie. So there's a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> I love your long answer. That's a fantastic story. Thank yeah. you for sharing it. Matthew, yeah. let's switch gears a little bit. Um, just like Tom Patry said prior to you joining, I know you're, he doesn't, he didn't like to use the word hate, so I won't use the word hate. I know you tremendously dislike live golf. I think you like to call it the live, live golf crap no, on your no, show. No. Here's no? the difference between Tom Patry and you. I hate live golf. Okay. <laughs> I have no problem using that word. Zero. <laughs> I hate it. Why? And the more that comes out about it, uh, with these clowns like Bryce, his comment the other day about it, the more I hate it. Uh, I'm a lot like Tom in that way. I, I think. It's all, I'm not even going to get into the political part of it, yeah. which I feel very strongly about as well. But I'm not even talking, I'm talking about golf. And I'm talking about these guys that with all their grow the game crap is a joke to me. The, the guy, there are guys playing on live golf, Chris, that I get it a hundred thousand percent that will never contend for majors that will never, you know, possibly make enough money to take care of their family for two generations. I get all that. I have no problem with those guys. Big problem. And it's all a sham, all of it. And it starts with uh, that Australian guy who I won't even say his name anymore, like, you know, the cheater and Bryson. <laughs> I'm really good at not using people's <laughs> names <laughs> and assuming people know who I'm talking about, um, that he's despicable. He's been trying to do this for 30 years. And when he finally got somebody that said, I will give you unlimited money to do this, and he he did it, it's, it's despicable. I really believe that. And I'm glad for guys, as I said. There are, there are some guys that will never contend for a major that will, I, I get that. I get that part of it. If somebody offers you $20 million and you may never make that in 30 years of playing golf, I get it. But then to talk about all the stuff with world golf ranking points, to make that choice knowing that you might, there's a chance you might never get to play in a major or on a Ryder Cup team or a President's Cup team, just that there's a chance of that, and you made your choice based on that, to come back now and whine about we should be getting world golf ranking points, sorry, that's not how it works. It is not how it works. You don't get world golf ranking points for playing 54-hole, no-cut, money up front, exhibition scramble matches. I play those in celebrity golf tournaments, Chris. Nobody's paying me any money to do that. And I wish they would. I go <laughs> live golf call tomorrow. I'd be there on the next plane, except of my hip, you know, of course. <laughs> of I'd course. have to wait till April. But, but, um, 
the whole thing just gets me really mad. And and the hypocrisy of listening to guys talk about growing the game is a joke. It's a joke. How how are you growing the game? I haven't heard one person explain that to me. Is it that there's music going on and all this other stuff around it? Is that how you're going to grow the game? I mean, it's a, the game of golf is about amateurs. You know, Chris, it's not about yeah. professionals. It never has been. And if you're telling me that we have an entire segment of, of people all over the world, young people who are going to take the game up because of live golf, I would go, well, okay, then you're, gr- that ain't happening. That is not happening, period. Is it good that the PGA Tour has made changes? Continue to change. They'll continue to make changes. It is. I just hate the hypocrisy of all of it. And uh, like I said, I'm happy to use the word hate when you and Tom are better people than I. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I feel I'm a New Yorker. You know, we don't mind saying things like hate. <laughs> There are a lot worse things that I say every day. Yeah. (laughs) Here's what I'm disappointed about with the PGA Tour, that it took this to make change. It's like, you know, the only thing that they've done is essentially copy everything that Norm is doing over on Liv. And if it wasn't for Liv, everything would have been status quo when they would have gone along just like they have since 1968 when the PGA Tour broke away. I'm I'm just sort of disappointed that it took this, that they had no foresight. And on top of that, the things that they have changed are essentially, well, we don't know what to do. So let's just do whatever it is they're doing over there. Yeah, I mean, in a certain way, I agree with that. Um, And obviously, there could have been changes all along the way. But this is not, to me, this is not the way to go about it. That's a separate issue. Do you know what I mean? Totally yeah. separate issue. To me. And I agree. It should have been done a long time ago. Um, but they're, they're, they're going to do it. If this is what it took, okay, this is what it took. The structure of professional golf that we all love, the majors, uh, the Ryder Cup, the President's Cup, all the, all the things that are rooted in the great history of the game we love, all of it, going back to the invention of the game of golf. Those don't have, those things are much different than money. They always have been, always. I mean, these guys, you know, the, a lot of these guys, as we know, and this is Mr. Obvious or Captain Obvious, but um, these guys, they, they have enough money for generations, and that's great. But there are very few of them. And the, the, by and large, the bulk of professional golfers, uh, could have used these changes a long time ago. The best thing about this to me is the $500,000 that they're going to give to guys trying to make it on the PGA tour. Yeah. That may be the best thing to me that has come out of all of this. And of course they could have done it a long time ago. Of course they could. But all the things that I hold most dear to me about the history of the game of golf has to do with things other than making a ton of money playing the game. And that's just how I feel. I will, there is nothing they could do, not a thing that they could do to ever make me change my mind about this. And to be honest, I hope the guys that made this choice, I mean, Dustin Johnson, the, the guys that have exemptions into the majors, are are going to be able to play in the majors, I guess. But all the rest of them, this is the choice they made. And they were told, by the way, that let's do, we'll just do this. Right now, you may not be able to, but it'll change. You're going to be able to qualify for the majors. You're going to be able to, well, okay, qualify for a major. Go to U.S. Open qualifying. You want to get in? That's how you do it. That's the, That's something that, you know, I just, I can't, Ooh, it gets me mad. I hate them, Chris. <laughs> Have I said that? I hate them. I, I get that. <laughs> okay. Matthew. Sorry, Chris. I'm just making sure. <laughs> Before I let you go, remind our listeners yeah. how they can listen to you on your daily show and then 
when we might get Backspin Golf back again, and then also follow you on social media. Well, we are, we just went on, I believe September 25th was uh, my last Backspin till hiatus, which I take every year. Um, because I'm, you know, Chris, I'm exhausted from doing a show on Sunday mornings. You heard my voice. I mean, really. Uh, and I always take a couple months off for this silly season, even though it's part of the, and by the way, how excited are we that, uh, we already know who's leading the FedEx Cup standings? <laughs> it's so great. Um, anyway, I'll be back in January. Uh, as I always do with the Tournament of Champions. I believe that's still in January. Yeah. And uh that'll be backspin. And every day, noon to two, as I'm recovering uh from my hip surgery, kind of off and on right now, on uh, WLXG.com. Uh, you can listen on the app or go to WLXG.com and hit listen live 12 to 2, every day, Monday through Friday. And uh Twitter at What's my Twitter account, Chris? You know it. At Real, At Real Laura. Laura. <laughs> R-E-A-L-L-A-R-O and the number five. <laughs> Matthew, I love you, my friend. Thank you so much for being one of the voices that I wanted to leave our audience with as we head into our hiatus well, at the end of the night. Let me just say this, and I've said this before, and I'll echo what the great Tom Patrick said. There is nobody better at this than you. Nobody. And there is nobody more supportive of that's too many people to count. And all of us are grateful that you, that you have us on whenever it is. All of us uh, are grateful for that. So as always, thank you. Even though I'm in a tremendous amount of pain right now from doing this podcast with you. I'm not <laughs> really. I'm just trying to thank you. <laughs> Somehow I fucked it up and you know, sitting on the You're couch. You're a trooper. Uh, you are a uh, trooper. Yeah, I, <laughs> I am that. Thanks a million, pal. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care, Matthew. Okay. That is the great Matthew Lawrence and a guy that I love very, very much. He's a, He's been a wonderful friend and a great supporter and a mentor for me doing this show. And uh, tonight was the 19th time I have been blessed to have him as part of the show. Uh, I can't thank him enough. I, I look forward to uh, catching up with him again soon. And hopefully that hip gets better. And I'm sure he's going to get an extra 10 or 20 yards. Don't let him fool you, folks. Don't let him uh, be a ringer out there and the member guest. Matthew's fantastic. And he's going to be out there playing golf and getting a little more distance by the time this thing heals up. Before I get to my next guest, Hal Sutton, I want to remind you about a couple of our friends, starting with the folks over at Strixon Cleveland Golf. The popularity of a cavity back wedge that can help golfers has grown fast. These are difficult to make, and Cleveland Golf is the only major vendor now out there making them. The CBX Zip has many features straight from the Tour RTX wedge, including zip grooves and a laser face for more spin around the greens from the fairway or the rough. Zipcore's lightweight density core moves the center of gravity, not just in the middle, but slightly forward towards the toe for forgiveness on mishits and a solid feel on all shots. The dynamic sole on any loft helps turf interaction, which is at the heart of our Chunk It A Little Less TV ad. Hate your wedges? Can't get the spin you need to hit it close? Swap out your wedges for a set of the CBX zip cores and save strokes immediately. There's a reason why CBX won gold this year on Golf Digest Hot List. For more information and to get yours, go online to clevelandgolf.com. I also want to remind you about our friends over at Sun Mountain. There's a company nestled in the valley of Missoula, Montana, that embodies the essence of quality, function, and innovation, and that's Sun Mountain, which started building golf bags back in 1981. They are an industry leader in golf bags, travel covers, outerwear, and push carts. With flagship products that you've come to know, like the C-130 cart bag, the 2.5 ultralight stand bag, the club glider travel cover, the Speed Cart, and Rainflex Rain Gear. Sun Mountain continues its quest to provide the very best in golf products to every range of golfer. Visit them online at sunmountaingolf.com to look at their amazing products. Okay, now next on the tee with me is another one of my all-time favorite guests, and that's PGA Tour legend Hal Sutton. He's a great follow on Twitter, at Hal Sutton Golf. 
He also has a great podcast of his own. It's called Be The Right Club Today, which you can watch and subscribe to on YouTube. Also, it's available just about everywhere you get your podcasts. For those of you who haven't joined me before when Hal has been a part of this show, and you may not remember what a great career he's had, let me give you a quick reminder. He was named the 1980 College Player of the Year. Hal won 14 times during his college career at Centenary in Louisiana. He was a two-time All-American, and he led Centenary to the NCAA Tournament. He was a two-time Trans-American Athletic Conference Player of the Year. Hal won the 1980 U.S. Amateur Championship, and he turned pro in 1981. Got his first win on the PGA Tour at the 1982 Walt Disney World Classic, and that year he was named the Tour's Rookie of the Year. In 1983, he was named the PGA Player of the Year after winning the Players' Championship and the PGA Championship. In 1998, he won the Tour Championship right here in Atlanta. In 2000, he won the Players' Championship for a second time. You guys remember that one, by one stroke over Tiger Woods. How captained the 2004 U.S. Ryder Cup team. He backed up his 14 college victories with 14 more on the PGA Tour. He finished second 18 times. He has 135 top 10s, 239 top 25s, and he should be in the World Golf Hall of Fame. And I'm thrilled he is back with me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Hal, thanks for coming back on the show. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Chris. Uh, You you built me up too much. (laughs) All I said is what you've achieved. It's not well, like I embellished I any of that. It sounds like uh, it's it's long ago. I've almost forgotten all of it. <laughs> Hal, you're a busy <laughs> man, my friend. Catch us up. What's been going on with you? Well, uh, you know, we've made some changes at the academy. I've got some new people there. Uh, I'm about to start building a golf course that I'm like ultra excited uh, about. We're gonna use uh, C.B. McDonald and uh, Seth Rainer's templates to build a golf course down here in the Houston area. Uh, super piece of property, and uh, it's going to be a fun project. Um, and I'm just not playing a lot of golf, and I, I want to form a guess that uh, after hip replacement, your ball is closer to you rather than further away from you. He's not going to gain distance. <laughs> I've had two of them, and the ball is far too close to me after I finish hitting it. <laughs> Good to know. I'll pass that along. Yeah. yeah. How? I mean, you, you mentioned the new golf course that you're going to work on. I don't know if you can give us any details about that, but if you can, please. And beyond that, You've done a little bit of coursework over the last several years. Is that something you want to get more involved in? Uh, I love that. Uh, Taking a raw piece of land and using it as a canvas to create a golf course that, you know, I've loved golf all my life. It's all I've ever done. So, uh, you know, to play artist for a while uh, is fun. And uh, this this piece of property was stripped from uh, sand and gravel a hundred years ago and there's big mounds on it and uh, we'll create a link style golf course. It'll be, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Chicago golf club is something similar to what this will look like when it's all finished and uh, love doing that. It's, uh, How you mentioned Seth Rayner. Who are the course designers that you like and who have influenced you? Well, you know, there's so many. Um, this has taken me back to uh, the historical side of uh, golf course architecture. You know, C.B. McDonald uh, was and Seth Rayner were two of the very best there was. I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but Seth Rayner was actually commissioned to do Cypress Points. And he passed away, and that's how Alistair McKenzie got to do it. Uh, wow. So that'll give you an idea of how well thought of Seth Rayner was. Uh, he did 85 golf courses in 13 years, and um, he was a study. He was a uh, an engineer under C.B. McDonald, so he he studied what C.B. McDonald was doing and. And uh, each time, no matter who you've been influenced by, you're still putting your uh, fingerprint on it, uh, your 
your version of whatever. Like we'll use the templates uh, to build this golf course, and you know it'll be my version of the templates. You know it'll be what the land gave us to be able to do with the templates, and so they're all different even though they have some common theme. Hal, I want to switch gears a little bit. And all the talk right now out on the PGA Tour is about Tom Kim. Guy's won two of the last four golf tournaments he played in. We saw him play really well in the President's Cup as well. But you know how we like to quickly anoint the next great player. We we have some sort of need to talk about somebody who is going to be the next great one out on tour. People did it to you. It was something that you had to deal with when you first came out on on the PGA Tour. Talk about what you're seeing from Tom Kim, and, and is he a guy that you think we should get excited about for what he might be in 2023 and beyond? Well, I, you know, he's obviously played fantastic. Uh, a part of his recent play was uh, compliments of Cantley because that was an unfortunate thing on the team. And, and, you know, from a player's perspective, and in order for you to be able to, uh, win golf tournaments and, um, just like what happened this last weekend, uh, it's unfair to prematurely label people like that because, uh, he hadn't got enough experience yet to, to handle that. Even if he is that good, he hasn't. It's tough. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, I'll be watching just like everybody else will. I'm pulling for him and hope he plays fantastic. Uh, but I'm not going to prematurely label him anything other than he's a great player. Let's see what he can do. Talk about the weight that we in the media seem to put on players too early you had to deal with that you came out and you were going to be the next jack nicholas what's it like when you get labeled like that what's that weight like well i'll tell you exactly what it's like i played golf basically for me because i enjoyed the game and i love the game and i had my own expectations i wasn't paying attention to what everybody else's expectations were until i failed them and they started writing negative things about me, how I was failing their expectation. And, you know, I, I woke up one day and said, man, I didn't come out here and play golf for everybody else. I mean, I, I just love the game and I love competing and I'm trying to be the best I can be. And to wake up and read about you're a failure, you know, in whatever way, I was still, you know, I wasn't winning every tournament, but I was still you know, finish, I finished second like three or four times in 1984. You know, the difference between winning and finishing second is very little. Luck, maybe, sometimes. And that's what I was trying to say about Kim in this last victory that he had. If it hadn't have been for, you know, Patrick Cantley having a, a bad 18th hole, we wouldn't be, we'd be talking about Patrick Cantley instead of him. It's a hair difference between first and second most of the time. And, so it's hard on a player to get those sort of labels. It really is. Uh, Tiger handled it better than almost everybody. Of course, he's one of the most talented players that ever has ever grabbed a golf club. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to play a lot of golf with Tiger. I was, was, uh, paying close attention every time I did trying to figure out what I might be able to take that he did and implement it into what I did. That's how much I thought of what he did. So, Hal, on the opposite side of that, we've seen players go through slumps, and it's hard to get back out sometimes. And we saw Jordan Spieth go through it, and fortunately he came out on the other side. We've seen Ricky Fowler go through it, and we're all hoping he can get back on the other side of it, but he's struggling to find his way back. You're a guy that, that had great success early in his career. He went through a slump for a while came out the other side. If you see a player that is like a Ricky Fowler, that is struggling to get back to where he once was or she once was, how do you go about talking to them, explaining things to them and helping them kind of mentally and physically get back to the great player that they once were? 
Well, so what I did, I don't know what everybody else would do, is I went back to basics. Um, I surrounded myself with the people that I knew were thinking about me when I wasn't writing them a check or I wasn't calling them. They were calling me instead. Uh, and that's usually the people that love you, not the people that want to make something off of you. And, you know, I sought their advice and went back to basics each and every time, went back to what I knew how to do, what I knew I could pull off under pressure. And little by little, I kept whittling away. I didn't ask too much of myself too soon. I just said, let's put one foot in front of the other and keep moving in the direction of uh, regaining who Hal Sutton was. Uh, I didn't try to reinvent myself. You know, we're living in a world right now, and this is really true of every golfer in the world. You know, we think we've never achieved the best we can be. We always think there's better out there. And, you know, sometimes the chase to be better uh, causes us to lose who we really are. And, you know, there's always people selling you a bill of goods out there. I mean, I'm, uh, this is no secret. Uh, if the shoe fits, they wear it. If the, if it doesn't, I'm not talking about you. But there's plenty of people trying to hook their wagon to the horse. And, you know, they're trying to tell them what they can do for them. And that horse is saying, well, I'd love to run faster. Tell me how I might do that. <laughs> there you have... uh a guy chasing the holy grail of themselves, you know, as far as a golfer is concerned. So uh, most of the guys that have really achieved that kind of success, they want more of it to uh, have their name etched on a trophy that they don't currently have at all. And whatever it takes to do that, they'll try to do that. Hal, a couple more before I let you go. And, and I had Tony Ruggiero on the show a couple of weeks ago and you two had what I feel like was one of the most important golf conversations that I've heard in a while since some of the stuff that you've done on your podcast and on his show is called uh, tour coach and folks, I highly recommend you go out there and listen to this conversation. And one of the topics you two discussed was how today's players, if they hit nine shots perfectly and then hit one bad one, they spend time trying to figure out why that one went wrong instead of focusing on how well they hit the other nine. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, technology that's available to everybody today is uh, has put definition to golf shots in some way. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough that I came along earlier and I didn't have all this stuff. So... You know, I didn't, everything was great to me. I was, you know, it was feel. It was, um, I, every time I was hitting the ball great, I was trying my best to hang on to the feel that whatever I was working on at the time, just make it last as long as I could make it last. And today, if you start playing like that, we have high speed cameras that are fast enough to see right where the club face is at, right where your hands are at. Uh, we can break it down as detailed as we need to make it. Cragman and all the other launch monitors that are out there right now can tell you exactly where your path is, your low point is, your club face is. I mean, so you can get details as detailed as you want. And, uh, because of that, I think it's made people forget how hard the game is and they're seeking what happened on one shot that they missed. And, you know, I just, I think the joy of the game is lost in that. I know it has been for me. You know, I teach a lot now, as you know, and I, I go out and grab a golf club myself and get up on the first tee and I'm thinking, what did I used to do? <laughs> How can I forget what I used to do? And, you know, it was feel to me. It's, it's, I don't know if these guys see it as feel anymore or if they see it as a plus two to the right because I want to hit a draw or, you know, I don't know. I really don't know what they feel. 
How one more. And you guys also talked about players needing to figure out who's to blame when things go wrong. Instead of looking in the mirror, it's the, the swing coach's fault. It's the caddy's fault. And the next thing you know, they're, they're firing this one or that one instead of taking accountability. And to me, that's a symptom of our society, the participation trophy society we've become. My, my failure to succeed can't be my fault. It has to be yours. So I need to move on from you. Am I wrong about that? No, I think, uh, but that's not anything new. You know, uh, we've all, Hal Sutton has suffered from some of that from time to time. You know, uh, the last person that we want to blame is ourself. But, you know, to be honest, if you want to improve, you must be honest with yourself. And that's what we talked about a lot on the show that day was, you know, you can lie to everybody else, but you better not lie to yourself if you want to get better. And, um, you know, at the core of every golfer, they know exactly who's at fault. And even if someone else made a suggestion to you on how you might get better, it was your choice to follow that path. And as I've told several guys and a couple of girls that were really good players, until you actually accept the responsibility of your golf game, you will never play it at the highest level. Because if you want someone else to be responsible for this, you can't count on them all the time. So, you know, and and your former guest, y'all talked about the LIV. I was hoping you'd ask me something about that. Do you want to, please, if you got an opinion, I'd love to hear it. One of the things y'all talked about was, is that the PGA Tour hadn't really made any real changes. So let me, let me tell you the changes that they made. In 1983, I made $450,000 from being first on the money list. Last year it was 25 million or whatever it was. So they made lots of changes. It's just not fast enough for everybody else. And, you know, Tell you how I feel about the LIV. I was taught to never bite the hand off that fed me. And if, uh, it hadn't have been for the PGA tour, you wouldn't even know who Greg Norman was. Right. And it's, it's always amazed me that people forget that. You know, the PGA tour was the platform in which all those players actually developed a name to where anybody cared. You know, I just, I spent 20 some odd years out there playing. I was on the board for six years. I saw how everybody, I mean, uh, all those guys have plenty of money in their retirement accounts because of the PGA Tour. And, uh, you know, it just, it breaks my heart to watch golf torn apart right now. And you, you, I think many of your listeners out there would have to agree that golf is being torn apart by this. I mean, we don't even know what to expect at next year's Masters. Who's going to be there and who's not going to be there? There was never a question of that before. All of a sudden, you know, when I played golf, we didn't go out there to play golf for money. Money was a byproduct of excellence. I went out there because I wanted my name etched on a trophy next to Jack Nicklaus's or Lee Trevino's or Arnold Palmer's. I mean, that was the most important part of what we were doing. And did we get paid? Of course we got paid. And at the time, I thought I was getting paid royally to do it. And it just, it breaks my heart. I, I, I wish, uh, that somehow this wasn't happening. It is. We're, we're all talking about it. Uh, I can tell you, I had to turn on a live turn, but I don't, care what's going on over there myself but anyway uh so i had to say that i asked for that moment to talk about it (laughs) i'm glad you shared (laughs) how before i let you go how can our listeners stay up to date with all the great things you're doing remind them how they can do it online and on social media well it's how sudden golf online and actually it's how sudden golf on twitter too so I haven't been as active and as you know, we haven't uh, done the podcast in a while. I just, I needed a break from everything and, 
have a lot going on and uh, hopefully we can bring the podcast back pretty soon but uh we really enjoyed doing the podcast and uh it's a lot of work as you know you're doing it you're you're working at it all the time and uh you do the best job of everybody and you you set the standard so high chris that I had to quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Hal, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to come back and be a part of the show. It's always a huge thrill for me to get to spend some time with you. I hope you'll come back next season as we start season number 10 at the at the uh, beginning of 23. You uh you set the standard for guests on this show and the things that you contribute. I can't thank you enough for continuing to be willing to do it. Well, Chris, uh I- I'll echo what everybody says about you. You are a giver, and you give to all of us so much. And, uh you know, I'm not sure everybody out there knows this, but I'll get a text from Chris, and he'll say, what can I do for you, Hal? And so few people in the world will actually do that. They're actually wanting you to do something for them. And Chris, you are, you, you stand alone in what you do. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the things you do for golf as it's being torn apart by others. So <laughs> that means a great deal to me, Hal. I thank you so much for that. As do you, you mean a great deal to me. So thank you for your friendship. Thanks for coming back on the show every time I ask you to. And I do mean it sincerely. Whatever I can do for Hal Sutton, I'm here to do it. Well, as I am for you, too, Chris. Thanks a bunch. And uh, take care. Look forward to next season. Thank you, Hal. Take care. Stay safe. All the best to you and your family. We'll catch up soon. Okay. Bye-bye. That is the great Hal Sutton, folks. It doesn't get any better than that. The guy had a tremendous college and pro career. He's doing a lot for the game of golf. He's out there as an instructor now. Again, HalSuttonGolf.com is where you can find him on online and over social media. You can actually go get a lesson from Hal Sutton. How great would that be? Go get a lesson from a guy who won two players championships and a 1983 PGA and should be in the World Golf Hall of Fame. And on top of that, he's just a sensational human being. I can't wait to catch up with him again very soon. Before I get to my next guest, Ross Greenberg, I want to remind you about a couple more of our friends, starting with the folks over at Adele Golf. Is your driver adjustable? Of course it is. How about your irons? Didn't think so. Adele's new SMS irons give you adjustability in an iron to match your swing. These new irons come with three weights lined up across the back of the club, By moving the heavy weight to the heel, center, or toe location, you can match the club to your swing instead of vice versa. The result? Total control of the club face for more distance and accuracy. Your irons can't do this. Check them out online by going to adelgolf.com. I also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Squares Golf. Are you like me, always considering new golf equipment, maybe a new driver, Well, let me reset your thinking because I discovered Squares Golf Shoes. The patented Squares Toe provides balance, stability, and a wider base for increased connection to the ground, effectively increasing your swing speed by 2.2 miles per hour and an average of 9 yards of distance. Independent testing proves it. That's right. It's proven in science. Go to squares.com, get the Squares 30-day money-back guarantee, and use promo code DISTANCE to get $20 off. Remember, distance comes from swing speed, and swing speed comes from your connection to the ground. Squares, the distance golf shoe. Okay, now back and next on the tee with me is a guy that I and my co-host Bob Lazari over in our football show Thursday Night Tailgate, we think the world of, and that's Ross Greenberg. As you guys know, when it's the last episode of the season, particularly the last guest of a season, I put extra thought into Who's the last voice I want you to hear? Because I want to leave you with someone whose thoughts and stories are going to resonate with you over the winter. Someone who has done really important and meaningful work and someone you're going to keep saying to yourself, that guy or that gal is really something special. This year, that voice is that of Ross Greenberg. Ross spent 33 years at HBO. He served as vice president 
and executive producer of HBO Sports from 1985 to 1990, senior vice president and executive producer from 1990 to 2000, and then president of HBO Sports from 2000 to 2011. He left and created Ross Greenberg Productions, and since he has made the best sports documentaries of this or any other time, he and his team are responsible for the all-access shows on Showtime, The Road to the Winter Classic, The Road to the Stanley Cup, responsible for David Ortiz in the moment, and a Jack Nicklaus series of videos for the USGA, plus Jack Nicklaus, The Making of a Champion for Fox. And these are just a few of the great documentaries he's done. He was also the executive producer for the movie Miracle about the 1980 U.S. hockey team. He's won over 100 major television awards, including 56 sports Emmys, 21 Cable Ace Awards, 12 Golden Eagle Awards, plus five International Monitor Awards and eight Peabody Awards. And I'm incredibly honored he is back with me again tonight here on Next on the T. Hi, Ross. Thanks for coming back on the show. Well, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me, and thanks for that intro. Very nice of you. <laughs> Absolutely. Ross, catch us up. What are some of the projects you're currently working on? Well, first of all, I just want to say, since Hal started the discussion on his own, live will live or die with one item, and that is whether they can actually lure people to television. If they don't lure people to television, which they're not doing, and they're getting no coverage of any of their, quote, exhibitions, then the sports washing that the Saudi Arabian government is looking for will not exist. And therefore, what they will be doing is just throwing money out the window and allowing a few golfers to benefit from that and take it all to the bank, and they will not be achieving what they their goal is. So I think I would give, and, you know, Fox has not pulled the trigger yet. You haven't seen any announcement that they will get any coverage of their golf tournaments. So therefore, if they don't over the next couple of years, I would assume they'll pull the plug and just continue to try to uh, make sure that Russia gets as much oil as they can and the rest of the world, you know, crumbles in golf. And that that's a sad commentary, but that's that's the fact of the matter. <laughs> How's that for an analysis? Yeah, so <laughs> hey, well take that a, a step further, Ross. I mean, with, with that kind of money, don't you think eventually somebody and it doesn't have to be a, a Fox or an NBC or an ABC or one of the major networks, but don't you think they're gonna find some network that's gonna wanna take their money and put the show on T V? Well, I mean that would change the d- dynamic of how networks buy rights to sporting events because in fact you know normally networks pay the the league and in this case you would have to have the saudi arabian government paying for fox to air their exhibitions and you know i just don't see that happening and that's actually what was proposed to fox over the last six months, and they said, no, thank you, because that's a ridiculous precedent to set of of a major league sports organization. So that won't happen, and I just don't think it's worth it for Fox, because it's all about, you know, advertising, supporting those kinds of rights fees, and why would Fox put that kind of money into an event that's no one's really caring for or watching? Yeah. Dustin is doing well. I mean, Dustin can bring all that money to the bank, and God bless him. He made $30 million this year or whatever he did. But, uh, you know, good for him. But it's it's obviously a money grab for all the players and the American public and, I guess, golf fans around the world couldn't care less. You've had a longstanding relationship with the folks at the USGA. Do you think yep. – a U.S. Open, a USGA folks are going to allow the at least the players that have earned the right, if you will, former champions, things of that nature, people that, you know, players that managed to stay in the top of the world golf ranking by the time we get to the U.S. Open. And then the other, you know, what, I mean, I'm sure yeah. I'm sure you've got a relationship with the other ones as well. Do you think that they're going to let yeah. those guys play? Well, you know what I've been told, uh, and I can't remember who told me, but everyone's watching Augusta. 
the USGA, PGA of America, the RNA, they're all waiting to see what the Masters does. And I think all four of them will go in sync uh, with what Augusta decides to do. Um, you know, and really, if I was putting money on it, Augusta, you know, tends to really play to their own tune. And I wouldn't be surprised if they reject uh, those players. And um, we'll see what happens. But, you know, a lot of ex-champions uh, of the Masters Tournament on that tour. So we'll see what happens. But I think, you know, they will all follow suit and take the lead of uh, the Augusta National. Ross, <laughs> I want to switch gears a little bit with you. And this baseball season is, you know, one of the major mm-hmm. stories has been Aaron Judge's chase of Roger mm-hmm. Maris's single season home run record. If you discount all the, the steroid guys and at least at a minimum, mm-hmm. the American League record. And you were the executive producer for Billy mm-hmm. Crystal's movie 61. And for the mm-hmm. folks who don't know the story behind what Roger Maris went through and how Yankee fans did not want him to break Roos record. Talk about that. And doing that passion movie with Billy Crystal? First of all, I I called HBO uh, in September and said, you know, I think you need to put 61 up again, and you need to at least put it on HBO Max, and it should be mandatory that every person who's a baseball fan watch the film as Aaron Judge was going for 61 and ultimately hit 62. Uh, it was a labor of love that, that film. We, um, we started that off during the home run race in 98, which obviously was really an abomination given the fact that, you know, Mark McGuire was pumping himself full of steroids while he was doing it. But, you know, it was a labor of love for, for Billy and I. I convinced Billy to direct the film and not just act as my co-executive producer. And we spent, I don't know, two, three years honing in on the script and then ultimately going to Tiger Stadium to recreate Yankee Stadium and going out to L.A. to shoot, you know, the majority of the film. And it was just breathtaking uh, to be able to work with the Mantle and Maris family and get their blessing and, and tell that gripping story of two guys that were racing for uh, Babe Ruth's record, one who the American public wanted to break it, and Mickey Mantle, who was everyone's hero. And then, of course, you had Roger Maris, who no one really was captivated with, who was living a clean life against Mickey Mantle's unclean life. And uh, and there was a certain irony there in America defining its heroes. But the bottom line was that Roger overcame some unbelievable obstacles. Uh, to hit that 61st home run. And it was a, it was a very emotional film and an emotional filmmaking experience with Billy, who was just incredibly into it. And ha- we, we just had a lot of fun. I'll never forget when we wrapped out at Tiger Stadium when we finished our last scene, uh, just walking around the stadium with Billy and, and just reminiscing on what we had just experienced. Cause these were our he- boyhood heroes. And here we were recreating them and making Merlin Mantle, who came to visit us. That's Mickey's wife. Uh, we made her just crying like a baby when she saw the number seven and the number nine on the field. Um, and she felt like she was seeing her husband all over again. And Roger went through. I mean, the, the fans didn't want him to break the record. The Yankees, the Yankee fans right. didn't want him to break no, the yeah. records. And they were booing him and death threats and the whole nine. Right. Yeah, I mean, they really wanted Mickey to break the record. I mean, it was one thing for Mickey Mantle to break Babe Ruth's record. But, you know, who is this Roger Maris? He had come in and, ironically, he had won the MVP award the year before, 1960, because he was a hell of a ball player. But he hadn't really grabbed on to the, you know, to the New York scene. And he was kind of cold and and a little off-putting with, with the writers in New York. And at that time... You know, there were multi numbers of writers uh, writing for many, many newspapers, and it just it just wasn't clicking. And, uh, yeah, they all wanted Mickey to win, 
that batting title and that uh that home run race and you know Mickey got hurt late uh and as it turned out 21,000 people showed at the stadium for Roger's 61st home run so um it just wasn't that big a deal um and of course he had to deal with the asterisk given that uh you know they they put an asterisk next to the 61 which was the title of our movie because Babe had done it in 154 games and here was Roger doing it in 162 and they didn't want him to do it. So they put an asterisk there and it was taken off by Giamatti, but, but it was a shame that it was ever there in the first place. Or Faye Vincent, I'm sorry. They did it. Ross, you also recently did a docu titled Extra Innings from 9-11 mm-hmm. 20 years later. And mm-hmm. the subtext to that was never forget. Is is that why you made the film? Because you didn't want people to forget and perhaps educate those who either weren't born yet or were just too yeah, young to remember what happened? I know. It all, it almost was dumbfounding to me that we were making that film 20 years later and there were people that were trying to experience that time and place uh, and hadn't been born. Um, yeah, that was the motivation. TNT approached and said, we'd like to make this film. Now, I had made a film for HBO in like 2004 because I had experienced, you know, that traumatic September, October, November uh, in New York because that's where I live. And, and you know, I had lost my mom on September 9th, if you can believe it, 2001, and was at her funeral uh, when those planes struck uh, giving a eulogy. So... You know, for me, it was a harrowing experience. I came back and a month later, you know, in October, I found myself at game three. Um, my wife didn't even want me to go to the game because she thought the stadium was going to get bombed. But I went and, and had the experience I've never had before at a, at a stadium, which, you know, first of all, the guttural kind of roar of that crowd was unlike anything I had never, ever witnessed because of the traumatic events of 9-11 and and what the city was going through and what we wanted to do with that film and then the subsequent film 20 years later was to update everyone on the people and the you know who we had touched base with in 2005 and bring their lives up to date and get a good idea of how their lives on lives unfolded after 9-11 so that everyone could kind of understand the trauma of that time period and also the the fact that 20 years later, you know, we needed to understand what New York City and this country and that devastating event did to us and how the game of baseball helped us kind of come back from it all and at least give our lives some sense of normalcy, which is exactly what I personally was going through at the time. Um, so it was it was it was an important documentary and I, and I hope that it you know gets seen for many many years to come so we will never forget. And Ross, you brought back a lot of the players that were involved at that time. I mean, you had mm-hmm. Joe Torre and Bobby Valentine, Mike Piazza, Derek mm-hmm. Jeter. What was it like understanding what those events were like for them, kind of seeing it all through their eyes? Yeah, it was nice, Chris. It was you know, they could actually take time and reflect on it because they could understand the importance of those games to New York City and they could take time to finally reflect on the importance of their baseball exploits, but also their off the field kind of generous uh take on, on how to help people. Uh, in New York City and, and the, and the suburbs during that time period. And I think it was very emotional for Joe. He broke down during our interview, uh, as did Bobby. Um, but you could really see that, you know, many times we just look at them as, as kind of statues and heroes. Um, we don't see them as, as normal human beings that, that just try to use their platform in baseball to help people. Uh, during desperate times, which is exactly what we were dealing with. And you mentioned helping people, Ross, and you did a great job not dwelling on the loss, 
but tying in the hope and the determination that people have had right. over the last 20 years. Talk about that. Well, because at the time, if you remember, and this is hard for people to understand now, given the horrible times that we're going through, but you know, there was a, there was post traumatic stress of, of 9-11 created an odd situation where, you know, I remember walking by, uh, fire stations and seeing policemen, even after game three, the Yankees had won and I was leaving the stadium. And, and as I was leaving, there were 10 cops when I was going to my car and I high fived all 10 of them. High fived them, you know, one after another in row, in a row and with a smile on my face and a tear in my eye because there was a connection between people in New York and the cops and the, and the firefighters, uh, because they were so heroic during this time period. So, you know, God knows we don't have that kind of relationship now and we should, but, um, you know, it takes, sometimes it takes a tragedy like that. So I, I think that, you know, that kind of feeling was very necessary to bring back 20 years later so you could understand the time and place and how this country can unite, uh, instead of the fractious craziness that we go through today when there is a tragedy like that. Just like you saw even with the hurricane down in, you know, uh, Florida recently um you know you saw DeSantis and Biden standing side by side so you know baseball was kind of a vehicle to bring people together and even people outside in New York were actually rooting for the Yankees <laughs> which <laughs> which is something that hadn't existed before um right. because they were they were really thinking about New York City Ross <laughs> switching gears again you you know my golf idol is Jack Nicholas, we've talked about yeah, it oh some God. of the other times yeah. that you've been on the show. And, and Jack, the making of a champion is my favorite docu that you've done along mm -hmm. with some of the stuff you've done about the 1980 hockey team. But in this one, you interview many of the great players from his era. And, and mm -hmm. I was curious, did, did you learn different things about Jack by talking about him through to those players and, and understanding who Jack was and what he was? through their eyes. Yeah, I mean it's what he represented, you know, and and what, you know, how he came along and like Tiger, he played a game that no one was familiar with. Uh, you know, he was hitting those woods long, much longer than the rest of the field. And precise and his iron game, his one iron, his dogged uh putting that he seemed to sink everything uh and his incredible competitive drive to not only win 18 majors but come in second uh every time he he went into a major tournament if he didn't win it and you know i i just don't think the game had ever seen anything like him um and it it, it really was the beginnings of of golf in this country in terms of media exposure and, and setting a tone. Um, and, and the other thing about Jack is, you know, as he aged and he's still quite active, as you know, he really kind of settled down and, and can start to reflect and appreciate, uh, who he was and, and what his impact was all about in a, in a kind of humble way. I mean, he, you know, getting to know him, I did three docus with him, uh, and he just, he's fun. He, you know, it's the most fun I ever had was sitting down with him. And, and whenever we do an interview, he'd say, now you got to understand, um, that when I started interviewing, he was like 72 and then, you know, 75 and 77. And during those in, uh, instances when we sit down at his house, he would always at the beginning of the interview say, you know, I don't remember that much anymore. And then we'd start talking and doing the interview and he'd tell me about every shot and every major that he ever hit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, always cracked, it always cracked me up and I always teased him about it. You know, whenever he raised that prior to the interview, I said, yeah, yeah, sure, Jack, I know. You don't know any, can't remember anything. And, um, and we just had a great time doing it. And I, I think, you know, one of the most 
the fun loving things that I do is at the end of a, uh, the long process of doing a documentary, many times there are, uh, premieres. And I'll never forget when we did the premiere of the film you're talking about, the making of a champion or whatever. And we sat side by side next to each other. And uh, I could see the smile on his face at the end of the film. And there's no greater satisfaction as a filmmaker than when you can see the subject really enjoy what he's watching and appreciate that, you know, we tried our hardest to, to give the truth and to tell people exactly who he was and what he accomplished and what he stood for. Um, and Barbara was also... So gracious. I don't know if you've ever met her, Chris, but she's really special too. And the two of them are just really giving, loving, wonderful people. Well, so let's take that a half step forward because you've done so many wonderful docus. And at the end of those, when you do those premieres, along the same lines you mentioned of getting to see the smile on Jack's face or maybe also on Barbara Nicholas's face for the great job you've done. What have been some of the other premieres where you've got to sit with the subjects and just watch them enjoy what you put out there? Well, I'll never forget when we did Miracle and, you know, we went out to Hollywood and and did the premiere for the movie. And we invited all 20 of the U.S. hockey team players back together, which was very rare that they were all in one place together. And we screened the movie for them and the Herb Brooks family. Herb, unfortunately, passed, you know, a couple weeks before we started principal photography on that movie. He was part of, you know, I had gotten the rights from him to to actually do the film. Um, but then he passed in the middle of pre-production. So the family was there and all the players were there. And, you know, they were watching the film for the first time. And to actually sit in that theater and then watch them smiling and, and enjoying themselves and, and getting their reaction to the film. But more than that, at the end of the film, the, the entire, you know, 500 people audience, uh, stood up and started applauding, you know, in a almost screaming wow. as if they had just won the gold medal again. But here's the wow, okay, Chris? Disney was smart enough to take up the curtain on the other side of the screen, and there standing <laughs> were the 20 players in their in their uniforms, in wow. their jerseys. And the place just cried their eyes out. I mean, I've no, never, yeah. you know, it was almost as if we were watching the game. And uh, that was the premiere you know, beyond all premieres and not something I'll never forget. No doubt. That's fantastic. <laughs> Ross, be before I let you go again, like what, are, what are some of the things you're working on now that we can look forward to? Well, I'll tell you something, you know, Bill Russell was a close friend for many, many years. Um, he was very special. I would put him right on par with, two other people that I got to know real well, Billy Jean King and Arthur Ashe. And about a year and a half ago, uh, put together a group to set out to do the definitive Bill Russell documentary. And Netflix bought it. And in, after the first of the year, you'll start hearing about it next week. They did announce it a couple months ago, but now you're going to start hearing the drumbeat. Very proud, Sam Pollard directing, uh, myself, Larry Gordon, who did Field of Dreams, and a guy named Mike Richardson, all working. And Larry did about 80 other films that you know, like Die Hard, 48 Hours, you know, Hellboy, uh, you know, everything you can think of. And, uh, we, we have been really grinding away and putting together a very important, big, uh, two episode, three hour film on this life story of Bill Russell. And we happened to, you know, uh, do the last interview with Bill, uh, which is in the film. Um, and we accumulated seven other interviews with Bill over the years and interviewed about 35 people who were close first person with Bill. 
to describe what this man's life is all about. Now, little did, well, little, I shouldn't say little do we know. I mean, he was in the later years of his life and we knew he was failing and he passed. And then you saw the outpouring of love and the storyline of Bill Russell. You, you kind of know the story, but here you will get the understanding as to why when he passed away, it was such a significant, you know, passing and like Ali almost, uh, you'll get a better understanding of, of what he meant to this country and around the world. Ross, before I let you go, how can our listeners stay up to date with all the great things you're doing? How can we follow you online and on social media as well? So I have uh, RossGreenbergProductions.com, which is a site that uh, kind of looks at everything we've done and everything we're going to do. Although I need to update it more. I'm not as good as you, Chris, at doing <laughs> that. But, uh, but, but uh, you know, that is, uh, that is one way to keep up. Uh, and I am on Twitter, although, you know, I, I don't go on there too much. Um, but, uh, I guess, you know, I need a good PR firm to, to keep the ball rolling so that people do know, because that is a change, Chris, in our industry. It's very hard to break through PR wise and alert people, um, as to what's coming up. It is, uh, kind of a, a sad commentary, even the networks are having problems, you know, promoting their product. Um, because Is that right? When you're, yeah, because think about it. When you're streaming shows and most of us go home and look for our, you know, series that we're going to get into and start binge watching, you're not seeing a lot of promos when you do that. And, uh, yeah. and you really lose sight of, and no one's reading the newspaper. Yeah, you go online, but it's just you don't have the awareness that you used to, you know. Um, so you can put up some billboards, I guess. But even the networks, they don't they don't want to market and spend all that money. Uh, and so it's almost like you have to have a word of mouth situation, which is fine by me. That just puts pressure on us. You know, to deliver a product that, that gets that word of mouth. And I, I think the Bill Russell project will do that. Um, but I need to go on shows with Chris Mascaro too, in order to get the word out. Wow. Chris <laughs> Mascaro is always here for you, Ross Greenberg. So <laughs> okay. you, you need, you need you word it. of mouth. I got a mouth and I got a microphone and, <laughs> and I've got a little bit of a following on social media. So whatever you need <laughs> to get out good. there, please let me know and we'll get it out uh, there. You for got me. it. You got it. Ross, you I, can't, got it. I can't thank you enough. You're absolutely one All of my right. all-time favorite people to get to talk to. Thanks, and Chris. and you've been so gracious with your time with, with uh, this show and on Thursday Night Tailgate as well. I hope I get the privilege of catching up with you again soon. You got it. Thanks. Take care, Ross. Okay, you too. That is the great Ross Greenberg, folks. And you want to talk about the preeminent guy for making documentaries and films. It doesn't get any bigger or better than that guy. Again, you look at over the hundred awards that he has won for the for the films that he has done. Ross Greenberg um, Productions is the name of the website. I highly recommend you go on there and take a look around at the things that he has done and created for the sports world. And then just, you know, again, that 9-11 uh, documentary we were talking about, very important. Please go out there and watch it. It's fantastically done, of course, because Ross did it. But the information and the things that you'll see um, are, are very important for us to never forget and what it was like for our country and then how we made our way back in the important role that the game of baseball played in it. And then selfishly, you know what a huge Jack Nicholas fan I am. And he has done a handful of documentaries on Jack. This last one um, is as good as anything you'll ever see about Jack Nicholas, the game of golf, what it takes to be a champion, and the things that Jack did to get to where he got. So, and then 61 is one of my all-time favorites. You guys know I hate the Yankees. Hate the Yankees. I'm a Red Sox fan and a Pirates fan, but can't stand the Yankees. 61, brilliant. And based on what we just saw to Ross's point, it should be something that every baseball fan goes out there to see, to understand what it was like for Roger Maris and his chase for 61. Brilliant stuff. All right, my friends, it is time for me to put a bow on this season 
of Next on the Tee. My sincere thanks again tonight to Tom Patrick, Matthew Lawrence, Hal Sutton, and Ross Greenberg for making it a very special night. Folks, I have some special segments that I'm going to be doing for you throughout the winter, so stay close to this podcast, and it's available on every podcasting app out there or our website, nextonthetee.net. I've got an interview with golf writer Jay Ravel that I'll be putting out soon. I had a conversation earlier this week with Billy Mayfair. I'll be putting that out as well. And please keep voting for the show in the Podcast Magazine Hot 50 list. You can do it at podcastmagazine.com forward slash hot 50. Folks, it's been an honor bringing you another season of Next on the Tee. You are all the greatest supporters in the history of podcasts. Thank you so much for being so great to me, so great to the show. Until next time, hit them straight, my friends.